Hi folks, welcome back. So today I want to take a look at a very fascinating paper which combines two important questions. The first one is, does the design of programming languages matter? When we design a programming language with certain features, does it help programmers write programs with fewer bugs? And the second question is, can we take important, often cited papers in computer science and reproduce their findings? Now, ideally, if we wanted to quantify the benefits of a certain language feature or of a certain programming language over another one, we would perform an experiment where we'd get two sets of developers making the same application under these two different conditions, two different languages or two different language features. Of course, that's prohibitively expensive. So we fall back on other methodologies that are a substitute for this. One such substitute is to look at a large body of existing projects implemented in many different programming languages. The paper we're looking at currently was inspired by trying to reproduce the findings of an earlier, very highly cited paper from 2014. That original paper tried to find a link between programming languages and software quality. And what they did in that paper was download about 700 projects from GitHub and these projects were written in 17 different programming languages and then manually identified how many commits in the commit history of those projects were for bug fixes. They then tried to fit a statistical model, in this case a negative binomial regression, on this data to see if they could find correlations between languages and how many bugs or defects projects implemented in those languages had. What they found was a statistically significant correlation between some languages and defects in projects implemented in those languages. They also found a relationship between the class of the language, in other words, whether it was a functional language or an imperative language, and the defects. Now, obviously, if true, these are very significant findings, and that's why this paper got a lot of citations. But it's always important to notice that what they found here was correlation and not causation. The original paper was careful to point out the distinction between these two. However, many of the people that cited this original paper missed this important nuance they went from correlation to assuming there was causation between the choice of language and how many bugs ended up being implemented in a project that used that language. So the authors of this paper took it upon themselves to try and reproduce the findings of that original paper. There are several ways to go about trying to reproduce an existing result one of them, which the authors here do, is to simply repeat the experiment. So you try to get the same data and the same scripts or programs that the original authors use and run them again to see if you get the same numerical results. You could go one step further and do a reanalysis, which means you try to use slightly different methodology but try to answer the same question. But to get the highest level of certainty, you would need to do a full reproduction of the experiment, which is you repeat the entire experiment, gather a new set of data, perform a new set of analysis, and are able to get the same result. The authors of this paper did the first two. They repeated the experiment, and then they performed a reanalysis of it. Now, you may think that Repeating the experiment would be as simple as asking the original authors for their data and their programs and then running it, but unfortunately it's not as straightforward as that as we'll see. What were the claims in the original paper? The most significant one was that some languages 
are more associated with having bugs than others, even though they found that the effect size was quite small. They found statistically significant correlations, which means that the p-values were very small. And based on these associations, remember these are not causations but associations, readers might be tempted to think that certain languages are less error-prone than others. The second question they tried to answer was, which language properties are correlated with defects? And what they found was that functional languages are associated with fewer bugs than procedural languages. The authors of this paper reached out to the authors of the original paper to get the artifacts so that they could rerun these experiments. And while they did get some artifacts, these were not complete and the authors of this paper had to write some new code to reproduce the results of the original paper. On the first question of whether there's a correlation between language and defects, the authors of this paper were able to largely reproduce the numbers from the original paper with some small differences which are indicated in gray over here. The coefficient here is the coefficient of the negative binomial regression statistical model that they're using. And in this model, the number of bugs produced is the dependent variable and the language used is the independent variable. That's all well and good, but as we'll see, the story is more complicated than this. The other question which the original paper looked at was a correlation between the type of language, such as functional or procedural, and bugs. But the problem here is that it's very difficult to categorize languages. There will always be a lot of languages that don't cleanly fit in any one category. For example, TypeScript is gradually typed, so should it get counted as a statically typed language or a dynamically typed language? Scala was considered to be a functional language, but then it does allow imperative programming as well. And in fact, a lot of Scala code is written in an imperative style. Similarly, Objective-C was considered to be a statically compiled language, but its object model is very much based on that of small talk with a lot of dynamic runtime behavior. Because of this problem with categorizing language features, the authors did not even try to reproduce this question as it, it didn't make sense. Now this far, we have talked about simply repeating the experiment proposed in the original paper, but the authors went further and tried to perform a reanalysis. What that means is that they processed the data differently and used different statistical models to try and answer the same question. In this case, they were focused on the first question, which asks about a correlation between language and the number of defects. And now we'll start seeing how the authors in this paper start reinterpreting and cleaning up the data for this analysis. The very first thing they did was remove TypeScript. Why? because the file extension that TypeScript uses turns out to be the same one used for translation files. And when you take those out, there's not enough TypeScript left in the corpus to be meaningful. Looking at C++ and C, you have to remember that C++ uses a variety of different file extensions. The original paper also did not consider commits to header files but of course, header files in C and C++ often have a lot of executable code. Once the authors were done with these cleanups, the corpus was a little bit smaller. And this is the relationship they found between the number of commits and the number of commits that fixed bugs. As you might expect, the number of bug fixes is proportional to the total number of commits. 
they've plotted this here with a 95% confidence interval on either side. But a far bigger issue is the accuracy of labeling bug fixes. How do you know by looking at a large commit history which of those commits are bug fixes? In the original paper, the authors simply looked for various words like the word fix or the word error in the description of a commit and labeled those commits as bug fixes. But that is not sufficient because that leads to several false positives like this because even if that pattern appears inside another word, the commit will still get counted as a bug fix. The authors of this paper tried to gauge the accuracy of the labeling of bug fixes in the original paper. The way they did this was by sampling the commits marked as bug fixes and then giving those to 10 independent human programmers to make a judgment about whether it was a bug fix or not. And what they found was that about 36% of the commits that the original paper thought were bug fixes were not really bug fixes, so they were false positives. In their reanalysis of the original paper, the authors of this paper focused on what they call practical significance rather than statistical significance. Statistical significance simply tries to get a small p-value for the results of the experiment, but that does not always imply some important result. The authors here are arguing that what you really care about is predicting based on a model, and that's what is practically significant. We want to look at confidence intervals and prediction intervals rather than p-values. The other thing that the authors here did differently was to account for uncertainty in the labeling of which commits were bug fixes. After all that data cleaning and using an alternative statistical model, what the authors of this paper found was that out of the 11 languages that the original paper claimed to have a significant association with defects, only four were left with significant associations, and even there, the effect size was very small. In this graph, we see the prediction intervals that the model predicts for how many bug fixing commits we can have for a given number of commits, and this graph plots the prediction intervals for C++, which had the most code, and Clojure, which had the least code, and you can see that the prediction intervals significantly overlap. What this means is that even though there might be some statistically significant correlation between a language and the number of bugs in that language, for all practical purposes, the difference in the number of expected future bug fixes is pretty small. And just in case you were still not convinced that this is an exceedingly complex and nuanced question to consider, the authors here end with a number of confounding factors that they did not even account for in the current experiment. For example, how do you select the projects that you include in your analysis? They found 18 variants of the Bitcoin project they found a very significant PHP project which was purely educational, so it didn't reflect PHP code as it is regularly written. Getting code from GitHub also completely biases your sample in the direction of open source projects. It might be that commercial projects have totally different characteristics, but those are not in the sample at all. Another confounding factor is application domain. Very low level system programming may be more challenging and hence more error prone. You also have to look at the age of the project and the age of the language because there might be a correlation between the maturity of a project or the maturity of a language and how many bugs exist in it. In general, we see that bug rates decrease as projects get more mature. 
So these are all confounding factors that complicate the analysis of a question like this. So to conclude, the authors in this paper tried to reproduce the results from an older paper that found correlations between languages and bugs. And what the authors found that of the originally 11 claimed languages with statistically significant correlations, only four turned out to have statistically significant correlations, and even then with a very small effect size. So that was a paper which tries to pin down how difficult it is to answer the question of whether programming languages or programming language features have correlations or causations with bugs. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.